Both of these movies are incredibly bad, and even though I personally have a lot of curiosity towards the subject of disturbing manga and media that feature an interesting message that can be discussed, both iterations of Akite are horrendous enough that I had to watch them both a week apart from one another to get the taste of how bad these movies are out of my mind. To put it in perspective, a saltine cracker isn't salty enough to get the wetness of how boring, banal, and mind-numbingly stupid these movies are. The only memorable scenes from the live action movie is this one, where Sawa is pimping herself out to a pimp to kill someone who I don't know any more details other than that, and this person needs to be dead. That's the only thing I know, but it looked really cool when I saw it the first time. That is the level of capacity I have for editing this video, because I'd rather not even look at the anime or the live action footage at all ever again. That is genuinely the only thing I remember about the live action movie. While the director's cut of the anime feature a total of seven minutes of watching an underage girl doing the devil's tango with an adult, while jazz music blasts in the background for some reason. There's a lot of cowboy bebop-esque music going on in this anime movie that I don't know why exists because it's all awful. It's just so bad. But the overall the overall story of Kite is about an orphan named Sawa whose parents were brutally murdered in front of her like Batman. And like Batman, she goes into the custody of a complete stranger named Aki and Kane I believe. The two detectives assigned to the double murder of her parents, but the plot twist of the story is they're the ones who murdered her parents for a thinly veiled reason that isn't really explained to be completely honest. But more on that later because they both have this insane plan to train Sawa to become a serial killer assassin while at the same time making her their sex slave, which doesn't make too much sense, but okay. So Sawa kills corrupt celebrities who uses their clout for whatever evil machinations they're up to, like selling fake beauty products and scamming the poor fans out of making said rich celebrities even more richer than they need to be. Then you've got your classic evil rich businessman that does evil things and evil politicians that do evil things for their own political agenda. All while promising that Sawa will seek vengeance and find the killers of her parents dreaming of one day living a normal life, which will most likely never come. I tell you now, it doesn't come. And considering Aki's main objective, according to Villains Wiki, is to have Sawa kill whoever he wishes did and keep Sawa under his leash as his sex slave, of course, which I'm more inclined to believe this Wikipedia page, considering is more consistent than the movie itself, which is constantly inconsistent with his directing, narrative, and dialogue. But circling back to the main story, eventually Saw meets another assassin named Obori, but I'ma call him Obito because I can. But after an assassination and a dialogue exchange that has Obito asking Sawa, Wow, did you really kill those people? And Sawa responding, Yeah, and giggling like a naughty schoolgirl, which she is a naughty schoolgirl, they fall headfirst into a friendship while fulfilling their master's request. As assassins, as they talk, hang out, and kill more people, the more they piece together the truths of their obviously evil masters who sends kids to do their dirty work wanting to escape. But the first red flag in their investigation should have been, hey, these guys, these grown men, are sending children to do their wet work assassin contracts. Wow. Do you think they're cowards? Some time goes on until it's revealed Obito is leaving Aki's and Kane's whatever the hell they got going on. Master slash slave contract pact? Murder for hire guild after killing three more targets? But Aki orders Sawa to kill Obito instead of letting him go because the only way you can get out of this line of work is in a body bag, which is technically letting him go but not to the place where he wants to go. You know, he gets killed, it's death. So when that happens, Saba gets to drop on Obito, readying for the kill when he tells her that Aki and Kane were the ones who murdered her parents. But this is when Sawa reveals that she has known that for years and that <laughs> it just sounds stupid. <laughs> she reveals that she always knew that they killed her parents, which makes no goddamn sense, considering she's murdered dozens of innocent people for Aki and Kane's benefit and their greed and hedonism, and the very fact that Sawa was tweaked out as a sex slave all her life by both of them, which again, 
confuses the hell out of me because again, it makes no goddamn sense. Why not kill them now and get it over with? But I wasn't really paying attention to the movie to be completely honest after this. It could have been explained, but I don't know. Anyway, Sawa goes to kill some rich socialites and twin actors. Well, to be more specific, one of the twins. Then she almost gets killed in her struggle with one of the men in the restroom and causes a sequence of events that defy physics almost like it was in a Looney Tunes cartoon, but it's kind of entertaining nonetheless. But again, it makes no damn sense. So I was like, off a 50 foot skyscraper, falls onto a pole, then a gas truck explodes and she goes through a window of a mattress store and lands perfectly on the mattress. Meanwhile, while that's happening, Obito goes to kill some corrupt district attorney, but the man is actually a SWAT officer who nearly kills Sawa, I mean Obito, until Sawa of course arrives to save his ass by of course killing another innocent man that has done nothing wrong but done his job, which leads Obito to confronting Aki and tells him that he and Sawa are both leaving when they both could have left and I think he still would have got the message but Aki overpowers you know Obito and savagely beats him while Sawa comes to Obito's rescue again but is captured by Kane which leads Aki to decide that death is too good for Obito and forces Obito to watch Aki have sex with Sawa with the sex ending with blood spatter all over the bed honestly <laughs> This movie is just repulsive, but there's a caveat. This is a plot twist. This was all a part of Sawa's fucked up plan to kill both of them and get revenge at the same time. Long story short, the story continues to not make any sense. And the next morning, Aki finds his buddy Kane did at the same exact location where Sawa's parents were killed, which should have set off red flags in his mind, but for whatever reason, it doesn't. So logically, he hits to the spot where Kane was supposed to kill Obito but finds Sawa, who empties her magazine into Aki, and that's the end of that. But before the red curtain falls, Obito was shot by another child assassin, because apparently they're a commodity in this world, but we can presume that it was revenge for him destroying this kid's basketball at the start of the movie, because during that one section of the movie, Obito was walking down some alleyway and some kids were playing basketball. His jacket got wet or something, so in retaliation for getting his jacket wet, he throws the basketball up in the air, whips out a gun and blasts the ball, and the kids start crying, and they're all upset, because, you know, they're upset, so I guess they go and kill him for retaliation for them killing the basketball and another kid shows up to kill Sawa but the movie goes black after that so we don't know who kills who but that's the end of the movie my best bet is that Sawa gets killed she's really incompetent but that's not the end of the video because I got to talk about the live action remake which makes the effort to make logical sense at some points and feature a normal A to Z fashion beginning middle and end type story but its plot is nothing to be desired, to be completely honest, and it's the same plot as the original anime movie. But my remaining thoughts on the anime of Kite is it's ultimately a story about looking past people's trauma to see the good within people instead of the ugly, and that perhaps we create our own interpretations of good, evil, and monsters, which could possibly in all of us, but we as people ultimately decide which one we want to be. Characters like Obito and Sawa are people, people with a traumatic past, people that let that trauma get to them, and that led them to do horrible things. Obito, for for example, realized this and decided to become a better person by helping Sawa escape along with himself into a better life, whereas Sawa didn't really take that opportunity and did her own thing, probably got herself killed in the process, whereas Saki and Kane are just assholes. Now because we're talking about an anime that was released in the 90s and we're living in the future, the visuals of the OVA alongside its fluidity and details are quite immaculate, but once anime became more refined with its details and normalized aesthetics, spike kite looking good, I prefer the latter than the former, but that could be my affinity towards anime like Violence Jack, Genesis Cyber, Wicked City, Vampire Hunter D, Akira, Now and Then Here and There, The Fury of the Future, Steam Boy, an older anime I would have watched as a kid, but when I think about it more my nostalgia for the past could be because I have a distorted memory of it because it happened long ago. Now, as a whole, to summarize everything, Kite is an absolute travesty, an insanely strange anime. It isn't gory per se like other 90s anime, but the soundtrack mixing and the soundtrack that it features is smooth jazz over rape scenes and 
other various bad choices in the vein of Cowboy Bebop, combined with its schizophrenic jump cuts and lack of story direction make Kite a special kind of anime that I dislike, but I'm amused by and find very funny. Therefore, I give it a rating of 1 out of 10. Now, regarding the live action movie version, comparing Dragon Ball Evolution to Kite 2014 would be a no-brainer considering they are both equally egregious and heavily divert from their source material, not even close to respecting its source material, but somehow feature the same narrative, but makes it make less sense than the original ever did, going completely off the clock. For example, the story takes place in a desolate, bombed out third world country at war, then there's gangs, but the movie calls it a crime syndicate called The Numbers, because you know, look out, they have so many numbers in us, Ooh, and then you're never gonna guess what the numbers do, they take children from the streets and sell them to flesh cartels for organ harvesting and other fucked up evil machinations because that's what the story needs. More Mad Max than crime noir. And when the story adds a crime noir-esque concept to the story, which again never existed in the original in the form of a drug called AMP, that basically removes someone's PTSD by specifically targeting and erasing whatever traumatic past you might have had temporarily because plot reasons. You must be curious how this affects the movie. So remember when Sawa's parents were killed in the start of the original movie? Well, not anymore. When you take these pills, if anything, you'd want Sawa to have PTSD, so she's more motivated and inclined to kill people to eventually get to her goal because this is a revenge thriller like John Wick, or well, it's supposed to be. But again, that doesn't work because of the whole sex slave assassin plot with Sawa knowing whatever his name was that's played by Samuel L. Jackson is the one who killed her parents. By the way, I'm referring to Aki as Samuel L. Jackson now because I can. But moving past when Samuel L. Jackson gives Sawa this drug for the first time, I swear when I saw this scene, I thought Samuel L. was actually gonna blow Sawa's back out right then and there. But that didn't happen, he was just giving her drugs. And in actuality, after parsing through some of the scenes again, with Sawa taking this drug and how her flashbacks were delivered throughout the movie, I'm coming to the realization that this plot device sole reason for existing is to ensure that the story moves at a snail's pace. Because when Sawa keeps remembering what happens, but remembers more things when she forgets, but when she remembers again, she has a clearer hit and can remember more? It just drags the movie out. And then when she finally puts the puzzle pieces together, and works up the nerve to kill Samuel L. Jackson, she doesn't because reasons that are honestly beyond me. I mean, she's killed all these people throughout the movie, one more is not going to make a difference. And by the way, the action scenes in this movie are absolutely awful. It's garbage. Then the movie ends with Sawa and Obito flying kites. <laughs> together as kids and Sawa kicking her drug habit, which is a ridiculously bad ending. It's like the director came to the actor and said, hey, why do you think the movie's called a kite? And then they threw this heat onto the movie. <laughs> Put it in perspective, the live action movie is so bad, you can feel the runtime of the movie minute by minute. I swear I looked at the clock like 40 times. The point of this video is, if you ever watch any iteration of this movie, let it be the anime or the live action version, make sure you're drunk. Then watch the anime, because the live action movie cinematography, sound design, and acting is just atrocious to the point where my last remaining brain cell has been potentially destroyed.